The next item on our agenda is a joint debate on the European Semester for Economic Policy Coordination. We have Mr. Van Denkendelare's report. I do apologize if I've mangled your name. This is the report on the European Semester for Economic Policy Coordination Annual Growth Survey 2019. We also have Mrs. Harkin's report, the European Semester for European Policy Coordination Employment and Social Aspects in the Annual Growth Survey 2019. So I will start by giving the floor to the rapporteur, Mr. Van Denkendelera. Four minutes. You have the floor. Thank you, President, Commissioner, colleagues. D discussions on the European semester are always very politically loaded, and with the elections on the horizon, that will be even more the case. The questions we have to address within the semester are precisely the very questions that make us show our political colours. What is the uh, condition of our economy? What are the major challenges? Which uh, uh, priorities do we decide on? And above all, how do we ensure that we can hand on our welfare states to our children? Colleagues, some of you will urge us to go for greater investment. Others will call for greater fiscal discipline. Well, others again will put forward proposals to uh, uh, support green projects. As a Tribune Christian Democrat, I think that the best course lies in uh, an intelligent combination of all these uh, three. Our citizens are ill served by half truths or simple solutions. It's important that we tell them the whole story and tell our children the whole story. It so happens that uh, my little son, uh, Caesar, he's two years old, is here visiting us today and tomorrow. And I'm standing here on his behalf too. I want to ensure that in his future there will be a welfare state so that he and his loved ones can rely on it. He'll be protected if he becomes ill and get a, a decent uh, pension after a life of, of working and, and saving. That, that's the future, the great uh, story, our inheritance of the, the, the welfare and well-being of our citizens that we've built up over decades. All this is at stake. Ageing, colleagues, is one of the greatest demographic uh, challenges of the 21st century. It's an, an amazing uh, trend in, in itself, but it goes coupled with huge challenges. First of all, the cost of uh, expenditure on pensions, uh, health care and care of the elderly will increase hugely, which will put initial stress on our uh, treasuries. And then, secondly, grey means that there will be proportionately fewer people working and, and therefore fewer people helping meet the costs. And so it's time for us to take action on three fronts. We have to invest, we need structural reforms, and uh, we, we, we have to have uh, healthy finances. Because we, we need fiscal buffers, otherwise we're just passing on the, the burden to following generations. Secondly, structural reforms have to be carried out so that we can cut the, the cost of ageing with a, a, a proportionally smaller group of people of working uh, age. It must be easier for employees to hire and fire. My uh, parents were from a generation where you stuck with one employer for your whole life. That uh, model is, is already under pressure now. Our children will never know it. Politics has to uh, uh, create a, a framework which will allow for an easier transition. Uh, em employees have to be more flexible and, and resilient with constant um, ongoing training and lifelong learning. Now, lastly, if we want to be able to tackle ageing, we've got to invest in the future. That's crucial, not just in human capital, as I've already mentioned, but in productivity and economic growth. We need to invest in research and development, innovation and digitalization, and infrastructure projects. 
if we invest today, we will reap the benefits in the future. That is the, the, the path we must uh, set out on for the European semester, a, a social economic uh, compass, so that we don't stumble off course and pr provide a true guarantee for a sustainable future. Uh, four minutes. Thank you. Mrs. Harkin for four minutes. First of all, can I thank the Shadow Rapporteurs for their good cooperation, which I believe has led to a balanced report. There are a few amendments submitted, and I think with the exception of, of one, I can support all of them. They don't significantly change the content or the tone of the report, but they do improve it. So first of all, can I say how important it is for the Employment Committee to have its own separate report on the annual growth survey, because we have a different perspective to that of the Economic Committee. They are complementary, but they have a different emphasis. And this report and the previous two reports from the Employment Committee, I believe, contribute to rebalancing the importance of the social and economic issues. The economy must work for society, it must contribute to social cohesion, social inclusion and decent jobs. It must be the springboard from which individuals and families can plan their future with confidence. While many of the headline figures for the EU are positive, and I want to list some of them because they are important, the EU economy continues to expand, providing a, a record number of jobs for people. We are making progress on the social scoreboard. Household incomes continue to rise in most member states. The share of people at risk of poverty and social exclusion has decreased up to 2017. There are more women in the workforce. All of this is positive, yet there are very significant challenges that persist. To me, one of the major challenges is that household incomes have grown more slowly than GDP, something like 10.9% to 15.5% over a period of 12 years. This indicates to me clearly that much of our growth is not fully inclusive. This is a key issue for citizens and for the EU as a whole, and I believe it will play a role in ensuring the cohesion and therefore the future of the EU. Youth and unemployment at 18.6% on average across the EU is unacceptably high. And while the youth guarantee has certainly helped, the uh, issue in regard to resources is that it is woefully underfunded. We have the huge challenge of precarious work where workers are unable to enforce their rights with no social security and work insecurity as a major issue. And that's one of the reasons why I will be supporting the amendment calling for the banning of zero hour contracts. We have challenges around increasing life expectancy with 80% of the care in the EU being provided by informal family carers, 75% of whom are women. Yes, we have our work-life balance directive, but unfortunately, on the aspect of carers' leave, that part of the directive is weak and allows member states who choose not to make it a real choice for carers. We have stated clearly in the resolution that the EU's social goals and commitments are just as important as its economic goals and uh, are not just a means of guaranteeing economic growth, but must be a specific target in themselves. This perspective underpins our approach to all the proposals in this report on the annual growth survey. This report sends a strong message to citizens that we in the Parliament recognise the essential need to ensure our citizens can look to the future with confidence. So once again, thank you to all who have contributed to this report. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Now, on behalf of the Council, Mrs. Schutt has the floor. Madam President, honourable members, Thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss the European semester today, a topic of particular relevance in these times. 
the Council attaches great importance to the semester, and I am pleased to exchange views with the Parliament on this subject. If we are all to make Europe relevant to people's daily lives, we need to deliver on growth and jobs, high quality education, social protection and inclusion, as well as environmental sustainability. We should stress here that it is a question of ownership for the Member States. Through streamlining reforms, the European semester is aimed at improving the situation in each Member State and in the EU as a whole. An agreement on common objective is therefore important. Your report shows that we see these common objectives. I am glad we have this opportunity to discuss them with you today and that you have done so recently with national parliaments as well. To start on a positive note, evidence suggests that Europe's economy is strengthening, employment is growing, investment is recovering and public finances are improving. Yet, clearly, many challenges remain. You have identified a number of them in your reports. Long-term challenges remain, such as population, aging, digitalization and its impact on work, climate change and unsustainable use of natural resources. Boosting investments remains a priority in order to promote a more robust recovery and to secure healthy growth rates in the long run. The extension of the European Fund for Strategic Investment in terms of financial capacity is an important step toward achieving this goal. Let us continue to work together to spur social investment and human capital, to lift the remaining barriers and to foster a truly favourable investment climate. Furthermore, we need to support growth with smart fiscal policies while paying close attention to the long-term sustainability of our budgets and debts. We also need to implement the necessary structural reforms on our product and labour markets in order to prepare our economies for the challenges ahead. We must provide our young citizens with high quality education and invest in their skills today. Madam President, honourable members, as we are now leaving crisis times behind us, the legacy of the crisis remains a serious concern. Some citizens are trapped in a cycle of poverty and social exclusion, which they cannot easily escape from. This is an important issue for the Romanian presidency. Our policy efforts need to be oriented towards the most vulnerable categories of our citizens. They also need to be oriented towards those regions and sectors which are undergoing the most difficulties. We need to think of new solutions to new problems while seizing the opportunities ahead of us. The collaborative economy represents a huge potential, but it cannot be a reason to backtrack on employment and social rights. Employment and social policies need to adapt to the changes in the labour market, whilst workers' rights should remain protected. Environment policy, together with greening the economy and greening the European semester, can contribute in a very significant manner to the broad policy objective of stimulating sustainable growth and creating jobs. What is key is to focus on the full implementation of the reforms and to carefully monitor the progress in each member state. We should share our experiences and use best practice examples to learn from each other. Only by closely working together to consistently push for reforms and to continuously support inclusive growth and job creation will we be successful in creating tangible benefits for every citizen and in rebuilding trust in a strong and prosperous European Union. Thank you very much for your attention and for the contribution of the European Parliament, in particular the rapporteurs, on these important topics.
Yeah, I feel Thank you very much. Now, on behalf of the Commission, Mr. Dombrovskis has the floor. Madam Chair, Honourable Members, Honourable Romanian Presidency, uh, Europe is set to grow for a seventh year in a row. Uh, employment stays at record highs and unemployment at record lows. Uh, average level of both budget deficit and public debt continues to go down. Uh, our strategy, based on three priorities, investment, structural reforms and fiscal responsibility, is working. Yet, growth is moderating and risks are mounting. We face uh, trade uh, tensions and slowdown in emerging economies. Uh, concerns about the bank's sovereign loop and debt sustainability are resurfacing in some countries. Uh, among the homemade reasons for the slowdown, uh, we also see stalling reform momentum in some member states. Uh, some countries still have high unemployment, others face uh, skill sh uh, shortages. Uh, unresolved structural issues to hamper to, uh, uh, continue to hamper productivity and investment. There are still uh, high inequalities within and among EU member states. Long-term challenges such as population aging remain pressing. Rapid technological change and digitization change our daily lives and the world of work. This is why decisive action is needed. At national level, we need well-targeted investments and reforms to increase productivity and to foster inclusive growth. Good times must be used to reduce high debt and rebuild fiscal buffers. This, unfortunately, is not happening in some member states. At the EU level, we made progress on the banking union and the ESM reform, but some proposals still await adaptation, such as on capital markets union. Uh, at the Eurogroup meeting earlier this week, we continued discussions on how to support reforms and investment for the sake of competitiveness and convergence. Uh, the Commission is open to amend our proposal on reform support program to serve this purpose. Uh, we have just issued our assessment on the economic and social challenges in all member states and where relevant of macroeconomic imbalances. We also identified priority uh, areas for investment providing basis for a new programming of cohesion funds. Regarding macroeconomic imbalances, our conclusion is that uh, Bulgaria, Germany, Spain, France, Croatia, Ireland, the Netherlands, Portugal, Romania and Sweden experience imbalances, and Cyprus, Greece and Italy experience excessive imbalances. Uh, for Croatia, this is an improvement. We found this year that Croatia still has imbalances, but they are no longer excessive. This is good news also in light of preparations for uh, participation in ARM2 and eventually Euro area membership. We also found uh, imbalances in case of Romania. This was not the case last uh, year. It's uh, due to competitiveness losses and widening uh, current account deficit and procyclical expansionary fiscal uh, policy. Uh, we remain uh, concerned about Italy's public debt ratio, uh, which is not set to uh, decline and uh, uh, reform momentum has uh, stalled. So in spring we once uh, uh, again assess Italy's policy steps and commitments to address imbalances, also the level of ambition of national reform uh, program. Overall, since 2011, member states have made at least some progress on two-thirds of the recommendations, but as I said, reform momentum has been uh, slowing. To re regain this momentum, member states can count on our structural reform support service that has been providing support for 500 reform projects in 25 countries and further 260 projects will be financed this year. Uh, to conclude, uh, uh, dear members, our focused approach has helped us to steer the recovery and it must also serve us to keep us on the path of sustainable and inclusive growth. So I'd like to thank uh, the rapporteur, Mr. Van der Kendelere, and the other rapporteurs for the report, and I'm looking forward for a constructive debate. Thank you. Thank you, Herr Commissar. Thank you, Commissioner. Madam Tyson, now is the fourth the commission. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President, uh, dear uh, State Secretary, honourable members of Parliament. I would like to thank both uh, rapporteurs, Madam Harkin and Mr. Van der Kendelare, uh, for the two reports on the annual growth survey. The positive economic developments continue translating into sustained job creation. 240 million people have a job in the European Union and this is the highest number ever. 
Unemployment is at 6.5% and this is now the lowest it has ever been in this century. The number of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion is dropping and now for the first time it is below the level of what we recorded in 2008. However, there is also an however, we must not forget that growth in Europe is not benefiting all citizens in the same way as the rapporteur of the Employment Committee uh, told us. Real household income is still below the level of 2008 in some countries. There is still very high youth unemployment in some areas or a high level of poverty, including high in work poverty in some member states. This is why your report, Madam Harkin, strongly resonates with our analysis. We take note of your calls to do more on skills in work poverty, regulation of new forms of work, labour market inclusion of people with disabilities, work-life balance and housing. Since the publication of the annual growth survey last autumn, we have published the country, the country reports on the 27th of February and those provide a more detailed analysis of the economic and social situation in the Member States. For the second year now, we look at the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights. The country reports provide an idea of where we stand, of the challenges ahead, and they assess the policy response by Member States. We also look at the social uh, scoreboard. This year we see progress on all 14 indicators of the social scoreboard. Moreover, for the first time, the country reports reflect on the investment needs in each member state, and also more specifically as regards European funds. Our aim is to achieve greater synergies and complementarity between the economic policies, reforms and the cohesion policy funds, and I'm confident that the combined efforts of European legislation, coordination of economic policies and European funds will help making the European pillar of social rights a reality for all citizens. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Sean. No. Thank you very much. Now, on behalf of the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety Committee, Mr. Kovacev has the floor for one minute. Thank you, President. The uh, EU economy is marking a sixth year of uh, consistent growth as a result of the structural reform investment and responsible fiscal policies. This favorable economic environment uh, should uh, encourage us to focus on what is necessary to make uh, this growth and employment sustainable uh, rather than uh, overburden future generations with debt uh, we should make sure that they can sustain their own needs we need to focus on the risk factors that still persist and that is the aging of the population and the unsustainable use of natural resources. The uh, Committee for the Environment uh, believes that uh, a more responsible uh, attitude to the economy and a more effective health care, among other things, uh, would be uh, of importance in this regard. As reform is monitored in the Member States, a longer term view uh, should be uh, taken because it is not unusual that results uh, appear only years after they have been uh, reported. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. On behalf of the Committee on Regional Development, Mrs. Mihailova, you have the floor for one minute. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, uh, the uh, Committee for the Regional Development welcomes the positive dynamic pattern of investments and economic growth. However, we are concerned that the effect on uh, jobs and the labor market uh, is insufficient yet. Therefore, we believe that more investment is needed from both public and private sources. Member States should cooperate to attract more public and private investments to build partnerships and to achieve better complementarity of the instruments and funds of the EU. 
We welcome the proposals uh, for uh, the multiannual financial framework and the future investment uh, funds. Finally, I would like to emphasize the importance of the support for structural reforms that will be very helpful for member states to pursue their structural reforms. Thank you. Thank you. Of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality, Mrs. Garcia Perez. Gracias. Thank you very much, President. If we want to tackle the challenges facing the EU, we need to agree that the European semester should stop being an instrument telling countries where they need to save or spend more. It really needs to become an element of European policy to guarantee sustainability, whether economic, social or environmental. And we need to be able to listen to people beyond these four walls. People are tired of austerity policy. Let's listen to the millions of women and men who on the 8th of March went out onto the streets to ask for a fairer, more social and more equal Europe. Let's listen to the young people who will be out on the streets on Friday asking for a Europe which can make a commitment to combat climate change. If we really want to get citizens' trust back in Europe, we need to move from austerity policy to the policy of fair and equal growth for all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Otesun for the same committee now. I'll be very brief, Madam President. We're on the 13th of March. Five days on from the 8th of March, when millions of European women came out on the streets to claim their rights. As we debate the financial and economic prospect of the European Union, in the context of the European semester, that issue has been completely overlooked. I didn't hear the Council or Commission representatives mention this. And in the annual growth uh, survey, gender equality is just mentioned once in, in passing in relation to the pensions gap. We cannot allow any continuation of this in the next term. When you analyse economic policy every six months going through all the uh, the members' plans, you say nothing about gender equality. What are we doing? How, how do we reduce the gap in, in pay and pensions and, and work for a, a more equal society? I do trust that this will be changed from top to bottom in the next term. Thank you. Now we have the speakers on behalf of the groups, and I would appeal to colleagues because there's a very long list of speakers here. And I really would ask you to keep to your speaking time because at 5 p.m. we have the vote scheduled and you know quite what happens when we have the vote and it's not very nice for the speakers at the end when people are coming in for the vote. So I give the floor to Mr. Kosowska Ojeciewicz. Thank you very much, uh, President, uh, uh, Commissioners, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. As uh, uh, the Shadow Rapporteur, I want to uh, thank and commend uh, uh, Mrs. Hakin on a great and balanced uh, report. Uh, I want to thank her also for the, for the great style of uh, the negotiation. The report includes uh, uh, numbers and data to the effect that the situation uh, of the uh, labour market is really uh, improving. Unemployment is going uh, down, we have uh, more jobs and all the economic indicators seem to be uh, positive. But all this welfare, all this wealth is not equally spread between all uh, our citizens. Uh, there is still a huge uh, uh, 100 million strong group of uh, poor people. There is a, a pension uh, gap between men and uh, women uh, as much as 40%. Uh, so still a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us. Also, the EU is undergoing a digital transformation which will shape our future competitiveness in the world. But 
we have uh, hundreds of thousands of workers in those key sectors while at the same time we have many people in uh, Europe who, who miss basic digital skills so we need to uh, shape and support a future mobile uh, digital uh, Europe thank you very much thank you Sean. thank you on behalf of the S&T group Mrs. Arena you have two minutes thank you very much madam president the growth uh, pact needs to think about the policies of the whole of the EU and you'll be aware that we socialists and democrats feel that this is too geared around economic and budgetary considerations and not sufficiently around social questions why create jobs if those jobs are badly pa paid badly projected zero hour contracts for example and why have a budget which is balanced which is not permitting investments for the future in education uh, tra ecological transition and why have growth if that growth gets in the way of equality and uh, exacerbates inequality so we've got social and cultural inequality which are the main risks for democracy uh, we are seeing that happening in our Europe countries today. The proposal that's on the table today obviously deals with some of the social preoccupations but one of the, some of this has been discussed in the uh, employment community. Better access to education for example, importance to be given to decent wages, importance also to be given to collective negotiations and bargaining, reforms as well that do not undermine solidarity and the redistribution of wealth and let me finish with investments uh, for a greener future. Now I'd just like to come back on an amendment the EPP wanted to table and wishes to table for the vote which is to do with pensions. According to the EPP the only solution to have decent pensions is to be able to have private pensions. Now, I would say to the EPP that private pensions are the main obstacle to equality between men and women. Women today do not benefit from private pension uh, arrangements and uh, if, we re if we replace public ones with private ones that will just further exacerbate the inequalities that were witnessed to in Europe for women and we oppose that amendment because there are other solutions to sort out the problem of pensions. Thank you. Thank you. On the behalf of the ECR uh, group, Mr. Packett, you have one minute. Well, and bedankt uh, Tom van de Kendelaren, rapporteur, for your interessant rapport. We kennen elkaar nog van toen we jongere voorzitter waren. Thank you very much and thank you to Mr. van Kindelaar for that very interesting report. Now, um, we had the question as to whether people in our generation would be able to get any kind of a pension. Many young people don't believe in the generational contract anymore. We do need that and current pensions are being paid from current uh, earners and with demographic change there's ever less income and ever greater expenditure this runs to over 15 billion euro discrepancy in Belgium and the report deals with that so what measures must we take in order to cater for the fact that the younger workers are not henceforth going to be exploited and then themselves not get a pension we need reforms urgently because the current situation is unsustainable and if we carry on as at present everyone's going to have to um, put something aside personally if, if they want uh, um, a peaceful old age thing. Thank you very much. About the Aldi group, Mr. Kave Chambon, for one and a half minutes. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Thank you, President. Uh, Mrs. Tyson, thank you for coming along this afternoon. I'll be very brief. And... Uh, I'll speak Spanish. We have to acknowledge that finally in this mandate the focus has been placed on society getting out of the crisis in a social way and, and uh, a European semester focused on uh, employment on the social side. This needs to be much more evident. Now you're saying that the job situation is better than ever. Yes, that's true, but let's not forget that if there are pockets of unemployment in a country, it's a European problem. The distribution of uh, employment is a European issue and then inequalities, a lot remains to be done. The next economic and social policies 
need to give priority to stop the growth of inequalities and then there are two vital points for the future in order to achieve a social Europe first of all we need to have concerted economic and fiscal policy with regard to redistribution at European level and we need solidarity when it comes to uh, em employment at and unemployment um, assistance. And if, uh, On behalf of the Green EFA group, Mrs. Lambert, you have one and a half minutes. I beg your pardon, one minute. Thank you, President. And I would also like to thank our rapporteur from the Employment and Social Affairs Committee for the very good work that she did on this report. And I welcome the growing attention that we're now seeing in the semester process to climate change. The report recalls the need to modernise and decarbonise our industry, our transport, our energy sectors and, as we just heard from Council, environmental sustainability matters. Because if we fail to respond properly, we're going to see our economy and our societies pay an ever-increasing cost as we struggle to deal with the development of extreme and the effects of extreme climate events. If we think of the costs over the last year of forest fires, floods, storms, and what that has taken out of the public budget and our public services, the need to invest in resilient infrastructure and good, strong public services and utilities is absolutely crucial. And for that, we need the fiscal space to be able to carry out real investment. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. On behalf of the GUE-NGL group, Mrs. lopez Bermejo, one and a half minutes. Yes, Presidenta. Thank you, President. We've wasted yet another opportunity. European citizens don't want to keep on hearing down here that the political ideas that have led us into the critical situation we find ourselves in today must continue to act as a reference point for the years to come. Austerity was a mistake and a disaster. The policies used to manage the economic crisis have led us into the greatest increase in inequality in Europe since the end of the Second World War. The Euro has been used as a machine for increasing economic and social divergence amongst our countries. And as an outcome of this perfect storm, there's been a critical, perceptible uh, outbreak of anger amongst our citizens and as a, a threat hanging over the heads not just of the European institutions but democracy itself. In the light of the, the clear facts of this situation, our reports are still sending out a message to millions of impoverished people who are scared and are being excluded that everything is fine. That is just not on. It's, it's not reasonable. It seems there's a lack of interest believing in this fairy tale. On Google, people get confirmation of everything they've already seen, that not everyone is being dealt with on an equal footing. Certain member states are heartlessly tough with workers, and th they act as shameless servants to the multinationals. That is certainly not the way forward. Thank you. Im Namen der ENF nun Herr Siltra für eine Minute 30. Ms. Zaus. Mr. Zalster. Thank you, President. There, there's no lack of problems. There just seems to be one scenario that the EU uses to solve all problems. Let Brussels solve it. The European semester and the annual growth survey are saying this once again. Everything has to be moved to the political terrain in Brussels. The bringing in of the single currency has clearly also led to lower economic growth and higher unemployment than outside the Eurozone. The Eurozone uh, president performs worse than other EU member states, including the UK. And the solution is very simple. Just say goodbye to the Euro and get away from this centrally uh, governed economy. But although there's a simple solution, uh, Brussels, being a bit counter-revolutionary, says that because uh, central management is going wrong, we, we need more centralisation. 
growth has to be tied to sustainability, inclusivity, environmentally friendly policy, anything available to make sure there's no real growth present. Thank you. As a part a non-attached to Mr. Boucher for one minute. Thank you very much indeed for giving me the floor. Uh, average European citizen um, really doesn't know what a European semester is supposed to mean. I'll do my best to define it. Now, the European Union prescribes the most significant economic indicators for member states, and every year in April, member states have to submit a stability program. And the Council then asks the governments to correct their programs and to incorporate country-specific recommendations, and the EU then scrutinizes the way in which these programs are implemented. And so the most important national indicators for a national budget are laid down, and member states can only move within those parameters. So already you've got an issue with sovereignty, because sovereign parliaments are unable to determine their own national budgets, and that that is already a direct a step in the direction of a super state. To now we move on to uh, the next speakers on the list. Mr. Faber, for one and a half minutes, please. Frau Präsidentin, Frau Thank you very much indeed, Madam President, Commissioner, President Officer of Council. Once again, we have the European uh, semester package, and it was sobering because the main message was that growth over the next few months will weaken considerably. We've seen fluctuations recently and their implications for European growth are going to depend on what we do and on our political activities in recent years because we have been able to take advantage of a very rosy economic picture. But we are going to need to act politically in the next few months. But if I look at the overall picture, then I have the impression that many member states have not yet prepared sufficiently for weakened economic growth, and they have failed to use this opportunity. For example, France for many years has been in the deficit procedure, and uh, Italy is really uh, the poster boy for failure. And that is why I increasingly wonder why the European Commission has not done more to implement countries specific indicators as well as to ensure compliance uh, with uh, debt targets. And we have seen uh, countries disastrously crashing out. Rules are not implemented, and the rules of the game are simply ignored. And if in more difficult economic times, and this is something uh, that I think we saw hinted at yesterday, if we do come to bear the costs of a disorderly Brexit, and if we're not prepared um, to face up to that, the Commission is not prepared to see to to the rules are implemented, then it should leave it to other institutions to do so. Mr. Silva Pereira, you have one and a half minutes. Thank you very much, President. Ladies and gentlemen, the debate in this Parliament on the uh, guidelines for um, the economic um, policy turns around the European semester, but actually it um, fits more into the current picture of uh, risks and doubt and um, growth. Now, what we are going to be voting on this afternoon differs a lot from the original version. A lot of the proposals that my group put forward have been accepted. And so I can say with satisfaction that the final version of this report will get the favorable vote of the S&D group. And I would like to thank um, Mr. Van Candelera for uh, the rapporteur for all the work that he's done, all the cooperation that we had, which allowed us to achieve this very good result. I think the main message from this European Parliament is that um, economic and budgetary uh, policy of the EU does have to move forward so that it can do something about the slowing down of the economy. And we do have to act together, work together, so that we can have something that is more proactive, more inclusive, do something about personal and public, uh, private and public debt, and ensure that those member states that do have a budgetary surplus can do something more about the growth here uh, by increasing uh, inv investments and wages as well. 
these steps are necessary, but it all has to be compatible with investment so that we can create jobs, so that we can fight against un inequality, so that we can work towards convergence, the energy transition, the fight against climate change and the SDGs. And this other vision of the investment policies and structural reforms is necessary so that the European pillar of social rights can be made effective. These are the keystones of the necessary policy, economic and budgetary policy that we need here in the EU. Thank you very much. Um, well, I've been a little bit more generous with Mr. Silver because Ms. Gares from the same group uh, transferred her speaking time, but I can't allow her to go on any longer. Mr. Hogg, one minute. Dziękuję, pani przewodnicząca. Europa przeżywa obecnie okres dobrej koniunktury gospodarczej. Pojawiają się jednak zewsze zagrożenia i nowe. Thank you very much, Madam President. We have a three-pronged challenge because the current um, um, favourable economic climate is not going to last forever uh, because um, uh, digitalisation is there and a major investment effort is going to be required. If we're going to rise to that challenge, we must um, encourage economic growth in order to create jobs and fight against youth unemployment, improving um, uh, internet access, broadband, uh, removing the inequalities in education, put in place the necessary educational programs which have to be in line with the demands of the labour market. And I believe that the European Union has got this mechanism uh, which is a real toolbox and member states are going to be evaluated in 2019. Poland is not one of them because Poland today is strong. Our government is creating um, growth back home, and that's all to the good. One minute, Mr. Schaffhauser. Colleagues, if you have a... Colleagues, uh, if uh, you uh, are uh, minus uh, 270 degrees, so you've got a foot in the freezer and you've got another uh, in the oven, um, then, you know, the temperature will be fine, um, but you are going soon to die of a heart attack and that is precisely what you see in Europe. I'm talking about the gulf between north and south because uh, Spain uh, has needed eight years to regain the levels of economic productivity and growth it enjoyed in the past. Italy isn't there yet and France was able to uh, get over that um, but it is no longer to manage its deficit and hasn't been since 2013 and that means that monetary union can only work if we have an investment agency which invests heavily in the countries of the south. Otherwise, there's absolutely no future with the euro. Mr. Zainopoulos, for one minute now. President, um, there are many myths about the Greek economy and um, Syriza is in the process of debunking those myths uh, because we're seeing continuing high levels of unemployment. And um, people are getting to the point where they're not prepared to work for the wages which are on offer. And I have put these questions to Mr. Centeno, the head of the Eurogroup, are we going to see any improvement uh, from our point of view? And the answer was a deafening silence. Uh, it seems to me that the basic uh, purpose of the union, the basic uh, target, is to cut back frontline services and undermine the welfare state. Com um, um, competitiveness in the name of misery wages, that's what we are currently having and the business world continues to um, use the money markets as, um, as a, cas a casino and with the Syriza government we're seeing something which is ever more threatening for our people. Thank you very much. Mr. Becker for one and a half minutes. Madam President, Commissioner, 
representatives of the Council. First of all, I should like to extend my gratitude to my highly esteemed colleague Marion Harkin from uh, the Social Affairs Committee for her very important report but thanks also go to the Commission because the Commission does an excellent job year in year out this is a tool it provides for member states which badly need reform because the fact of the matter is that far too member states are doing what they should or are making uh, too few efforts to rise to urgent challenges with tangible reforms now particularly when we're talking about the state sustainable uh, securing of our social welfare systems I think that in future the Commission should have uh, a more robust instrument in order to warn countries, to remind them, and even to take stronger measures, more robust sanctions, because countries are failing to reform structures uh, and are then jeopardizing uh, the stability of their own and other countries and it is impossible for financially weaker countries to withstand such pressures particularly those in the south of Europe. The time for reform is now. Uh, Mr. Uzug, you have one minute. President, ladies and gentlemen, we do, of course, have to agree with a number of the conclusions that have been put forward in this report. For example, we have got to focus on investment, and that has to be investment for SMEs. The European funds also have to take more account of regional specificities. But I do have some reservations. For example, we are underlining here the role of the Stability and Growth Pact. Six months ago, we were talking about systemic problems in that mechanism because the mechanism is applied in a very selective way by the European Commission according to the Member State. And there are other reservations that concern me as well, and I will let you know about those at another date. Thank you. Power Thomas. Thank you very much, Ms. Thomas. You have one minute. Thank you very much. Madam President, obviously as a union we have made progress, but it is very patchy from one member state to the other. The secret is to keep the economy on, on course, but it's only possible with a wise, a judicious investment policy and economic policy, and that's for the member states. They're the ones who bear the responsibility for social um, betterment as well. And we have to pay more and more attention to the demographic trends to get a pro-family policy. This is one of the central tasks of the Commission, so that young people can have access to the housing market. And that's very difficult in, certain, in many countries. Um, fam families being able to afford a house is absolutely fundamental for the future. And we are talking here about the next generation, and uh, we have a vested interest in making sure they're well off. Thank you, Mr. Rosati. One minute. Uh, Madam President, Commissioner, I very much share the opinions of, of other colleagues that have been expressed here during this debate that the Union faces new challenges. We have the economic slowdown on the horizon, we have uh, unpredictable Brexit ahead of us, we have trade wars and uh, their implications and we have to be prepared to face these challenges. Now, most of the postulates here have been addressed uh, uh, to the Commission, but I think that the main responsibility is on the Member States. <clears throat> I mean, the issues such as the reform of the labour market, uh, <clears throat> attempts to uh, encourage people to work longer, uh, increase the capacity in uh, uh, research and development, in education, and also work in favour of uh, improving uh, the situation of our banks, especially in some states. This is all responsibilities of Member States. So I would encourage the uh, Commission and personally Commissioner Dombrovskis 
simply to address this issue in the country-specific recommendations. We have to indeed be very ambitious in this regard. <coughs> Thank you very much. So uh, we have completed the list of speakers. We move on to the Catch the Eye session. And seeing as it is so late in the day, I'll only be able to give the floor to one speaker per group. First of all, Ms. Malecci. The EPP. Thank you, Madam Chair. Investment structural reform. Thank you very much, Madam President. We need to work on implementation and we need to strengthen the uh, reform support program. We are uh, increasing the investment in digitalization and uh, removing barriers on the uh, market and creating also equal opportunities. I support all of that, but I oppose the proposals from the Commission, other which uh, the chief criterion uh, for uh, distribution of funds is the number of uh, the uh, inhabitants. This is not the goal. There, this creates greater inequalities among member states. The smaller member states which are mostly affected by demographic challenges, uh, so in addition to the aging of the population, there is also emigration. We uh, need our help and not the reduction of uh, funds or allocations from the uh, support uh, program, uh, from the support reform program fund. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. Promoting investment, having responsible budget and um, uh, policies, these are the priorities set out by the Commission, which last week gave the annual evaluation of the economic and social situation in Member States as part of the, uh, the winter package of the um, looking forward to this, this semester. We are um, uh, critical of the um, uh, budgetary manoeuvres undertaken by the um, De Conti government because we think that the um, uh, fundamentals are trending in the, so in the wrong direction. And in the south of Italy, we've got some of the lowest employment rates uh, some of the highest unemployment rates anywhere in the European Union. In economic terms, Italy has got worse. The situation has become has deteriorated, and there is a, a need for a change of tack. And reforms are necessary to improve the um, public finances. And we have the Commission must be uh, more and more firm with countries which are failing to shoulder responsibilities. Thank you, Ms. Maria. One minute. Thank you, Madam President. The European semester is a system whereby the European Union, in particular Council and Commission, infringe the prerogatives of the Member States because this is completely separate from the powers and the competences of the European Union. We are talking here about the, the national budgets and this is it's called the semester but basically Brussels is making it impossible for member states to pursue their economic and budget policy by their own lights and that, what that really means is uh, um, more and more austerity. Um, the Commission has no right to meddle in the pension systems of individual member states and there are governments which um, object and they are immediately blacklisted and this is how Brussels meddles in a way which is counter to the sovereign rights of member states and it's about time that Brussels confined itself to its own remit and left everything else to the um, to the, uh, whether it's pensions or uh, budgets, to the member states where it rightly belongs. Ms. Estridge, one minute. Thank you. You speak about high youth unemployment and wages not rising quickly enough. But yet, would that not be potentially one effect of there being a large supply of labour, supply and demand? A lot of people have entered the EU, many of them looking for work. Obviously, obviously, that makes it harder for the people already there. You speak about slow economic growth, but you say that your social aims and social policies 
are just as important as the growth policies. Well, if you take that approach, of course you're going to slow down the economic growth. Of course you are. May I suggest to you that the best way to raise living standards, to get more tax dollars coming in so you can spend them on really nice things, good things, nice projects, is to grow the economy with serious economic policies. Nobody would have heard of the Good Samaritan if he'd been poor. So, das waren die Reden. so uh, that takes care of the catch the eye uh, procedure. We now have Mr. Dombrovskis on behalf of the European Commission. Madam Chair, Honourable Members, Honourable uh, uh, Presidency, well, uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, debate. Uh, we are now uh, continuing as uh, a uh, dialogue with uh, Member States and seek a common understanding of the challenges and policy actions to address them. Uh, we expect uh, national reform programs and uh, stability or convergence programs by mid-April. And as always, the uh, uh, Commission uh, strongly encourages uh, close involvement of national parliaments, local authorities, social partners in a preparation, preparation of national reform uh, programs. Based on this, we will present our country-specific recommendations in a spring uh, European semester uh, cycle. So I'm looking forward for continuing a constructive dialogue with you in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Herr Commissar. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And now, Ms. Chod, the Council. Yes. Madam President, honourable members, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners, I would like to thank you very much for your remarks. You addressed important points and your remarks will provide valuable input for the discussions in the Council that touch upon many aspects of the European semester like the environment, competitiveness and social policies. The country reports published by the Commission in February represent an important step in the current process. They form the basis for the work which will eventually lead to the adoption of the semester's country-specific recommendations during the semester. When working on the European semester and debating the country-specific recommendations, we should always remember the importance of reaching as many citizens as possible to increase national ownership. I commend the initiatives taken in this regard, including the increased dialogue in the capitals and the consultation with social partners. Today's debate showed that while there are some differences, there is a lot of common ground to build on. This gives me confidence in our continued cooperation in looking at the challenges ahead of us and identifying appropriate solutions to tackle them. Thank you very much once again for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Van den Klaar for two minutes. Thank you very much, President, and thanks to colleagues for all of their contributions in the debate. Uh, the semester is always an opportunity for a political debate, but also an interesting debate. And I think we're beginning to see a consensus about what the challenges are for our economy. And uh, we've talked about gender equality, uh, uh, poverty, the health systems, the welfare systems. And we've talked about an aging population as well. Um, but of course, all of us have got our own list of priorities. Um, and is, it, is it just budget discipline? Is it just investment? Even that's not going to be enough because we need reforms and investment and budget discipline. All of those things taken together. And I believe that it's high time, President, that the European semester uh, was an opportunity to, to um, it's not just a list of uh, bad things. It's an opportunity for the Member States to go into training for the big challenges which lie ahead. And there is a job here to be done for Council. The reforms have got to be addressed um, seriously. It's not something which is a kind of um, punishment which is meted out by the Commission. On the contrary, it's an opportunity to help our children to rise to the challenges which will face them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the rapporteur. And uh, although there is a 
lot of noise. That was a very good summary. Now, Ms. Harkin, as rapporteur, you have two minutes. Order, please. Colleagues, please, please, please listen to the rapporteur. Chair. Therefore, it is really important that the country's specific recommendations are sustained from one year to the next. So we ask the Commission for follow-up on that. I was also encouraged by the words of Commissioner Tyson, who replied directly to some of the suggestions in my report, especially on the issue of in-work poverty and the regulation of new forms of work. A few colleagues spoke on the issue of pensions. And while we fully support universal access to adequate retirement and old age pensions, we also believe that other avenues need to be explored. And one of those is to complement statutory pensions with supplementary pensions. Three final points. In light of today's debate on climate change and indeed the huge challenge we face on the issue, we have called for budgets to be made available to modernise and decarbonise industry, transport and energy. In the context of social inclusion, we call on the Commission and Member States to step up efforts for greater inclusion of people with disabilities in the workplace. And finally, we deplore the failure to include housing, and homelessness among the top priorities for 2019 and call on the Commission to use this semester to monitor and support progress on housing affordability and homelessness as fundamental areas of concern. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rapporteur, for that um, uh, Summary. Um, that con concludes the joint debate.